Aloha, my name is Dr. Chrissy Mogren, and I am a pollinator ecologist with the Department of Plant and Environmental Protection Sciences at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Thank you for tuning in to the first advanced pollinator training class for the Hawaii Master Gardeners, an introduction to the pros and cons of honeybees in Hawaii. If you are taking this class to achieve the advanced certification and have not yet taken the pretest, please pause this video and take the pretest before continuing. The link for this is located on the course homepage. By the end of this module, you will have a basic understanding of the history of beekeeping, be able to identify some of the negative impacts of honeybees in Hawaiian ecosystems, identify some of the positive impacts of honeybees in Hawaii, and finally have a basic understanding of the general economic impacts of honeybees to Hawaiian agriculture. Worldwide, there are over 25,000 species of bees, and we refer to only a few of these when we talk about honeybees specifically. Most of these fall within the genus Apis, and these include the giant honeybees, or Apis dorsata group, dwarf honeybees, or those belonging to the Apis florea group, eastern honeybees, or those in the Apis serrana group, and western or European honeybees, which includes the species Apis mellifera. There are also stingless bees that belong to the genus Melipona, and these are found throughout Central and South America. However, when we consider which of these has the greatest economic impact worldwide, we're specifically referring to the Western or European honeybees, Apis mellifera. Humans have been exploiting honeybees, and especially the honey that they produce for millennia. The evidence for this exists in cave paintings and rock art, as well as from archaeological artifacts recovered all over the world. The oldest known example is thought to date from between 10,000 and 8,000 BCE. This was recovered in the Cueva de la Araña in Valencia, Spain, where there's an image of a person holding a bag to hold honeycomb reading a rock cavity. There was another example of a rock painting recover recovered from Taguana Dam in modern day Zimbabwe dating back to about 8,000 BCE. And this is thought to be the only rock painting ever showing a person using smoke to calm the bees. More permanent beekeeping structures made from sun-dried mud have been found dating back to the period of Solomon, and similar structures have been excavated in modern-day northern Israel, Palestine, Egypt, and Jordan. Once humans started keeping bees and rearing them for honey and wax, advances in our understanding of their biology as well as the technology to maintain them actually moved pretty slowly. For example, we figured out that bees could rear a queen from an egg or a very young larva in 1568, but it was another 18 years before we figured out that it was the queen that actually laid the eggs. And then it was another 150 years after that before the role of bees in pollination was described. Granted, part of this may be the result of limited access to books and a largely illiterate population throughout Europe. So it's entirely possible that these discoveries occurred in multiple regions before the findings were actually published. One of the most important early technologies in beekeeping was developed by the Greeks and described by Sir George Wheeler when he rediscovered it and described it in his book, A Journey into Greece, which was published in 1682. What he described was the first example of a top bar hive. These removable frames inside of this hive made it much easier to harvest honey and without having to sacrifice the entire colony, which was the common practice throughout Europe at this point in time, where honeybees were kept in skep-like structures and other similar hives. Possibly the greatest advancement in beekeeping, which is still very much relevant today, was the development of the Langstroth hive by Reverend Lorenzo Lorraine Langstroth in 1852. Similar to the Greek beehive, this has a movable frame design, separate boxes for brood rearing and honey storage, with the addition that the frames are separated by the perfect amount of space for honeybees to move freely around the comb without feeling compelled to fill it in with more wax or propolis. This perfect frame spacing is referred to as the bee space, which measures six to nine millimeters, or about one quarter to three eighths of an inch. This design was instrumental in increasing honey yields and colony transportation, which was particularly important given the expanding populations in Europe and North America at the time. On top of that, the general populace was much more literate, so increasing access to bee journals further spread the news of this design all over the world. Now, beekeeping here in the islands is a much newer enterprise. 
The first colonies of honeybees weren't introduced until 1857. There was a bit of a period of trial and error with these early shipments trying to get the colonies to establish, and the first commercial honey shipments didn't make it back to the mainland until 1894. Apiaries established quickly thereafter, however, and the early beekeeping and cattle industries are actually pretty closely linked. It was discovered that honeybees had a liking for kiave, so the trees were planted for pollination and the seed pods then fed to cattle. The entire beekeeping industry in the state started with just a few large companies. One of these was the Garden Island Honey Company, which was established on Kauai and produced honey as well as queen bees. On Molokai, the American Sugar Company established an apiary in 1904, and by 1930, it was actually the world's largest producer of honey. Unfortunately, the introduction of the bacterial disease American fowl brood, in combination with the Great Depression and declining honey prices overall, devastated this early industry and it was half a century before it was able to recover. If you're interested in learning more about the history of beekeeping in Hawaii specifically, there was an excellent article written by Lorna Tsutsumi from UH Hilo, and that is posted in the resources section for this lecture. The only native bees we have in Hawaii belong to the genus Hylaeus, which are the Hawaiian yellow-faced bees. Every other bee in the state was introduced from elsewhere. Currently, there are 19 introduced species, of which 18 are solitary. The honeybee is the only social introduced species in the state. We do not have bumblebees here in Hawaii, though we do have carpenter bees which can superficially resemble bumblebees. More details about the biology of the native and introduced solitary bees will be provided in later lectures. Social bees are very efficient at exploiting resources. The whole reason we call them honeybees is because they gather nectar throughout the summer and store it as honey to get them through periods when plants aren't producing, like winter. But here in Hawaii, plant systems evolved in the absence of social pollinators. And now we have a bunch of introduced weeds, many from other parts of the world where they do have social pollinators, either honeybees or other species of apis, that are attractive forage sources for honeybees. In fact, some of the state's worst weeds are propagated by honeybees. For example, glory bush is considered a priority species for eradication by the Oahu and Big Island Invasive Species Councils, and is present on all of the large islands. Blackberry, while delicious, is also considered a noxious weed in the state and identified for eradication on Oahu. Ivy gourd can grow up to four inches per day and unlike other cucumbers grown for culinary use, the pollinated seeds are viable and can be spread by mammals like pigs. Kauai and Maui counties have identified this vine as a priority species for eradication. There are a number of other weedy plants that are highly desirable to honeybees, such as longthorn kiave, which nobody wants to step on at the beach, gorse, which is lovely as a hedgerow in Scotland but takes over hillsides in Maui and Big Island, strawberry guava, and rose apple. We commonly associate pollination services as a good thing, but here in Hawaii, this European social insect can actually interfere with the state's efforts to control noxious weeds. In addition to the potential propagation of weeds, honeybees may also compete for resources with native bees, which in Hawaii would be Hylaeus. There hasn't been much research done in this area specifically, but we can make inferences from work on the mainland. In a review article looking at every paper published since 1900 investigating pollinator interactions, about half reported a negative interaction between honeybees and native bees, resulting from resource competition where the honeybees exploited the available nectar and pollen more efficiently and deprived the native bees of these resources. About 70% of studies looking at the potential for disease transmission reported negative effects, indicating that viruses especially may be impacting native bees as a result of interacting on the same flowers. In Hawaii, the only published example of honeybees interacting with Hylaeus is in an Ohia forest specifically. There, the authors found that honeybees competed more with invasive ants for nectar resources than with Hylaeus, which were collecting pollen. In this case, though they were visiting the same flower, they did not compete because they collected different resources. Whether this is true in other ecosystems where Hylaeus are dependent, like sensitive coastal communities, is unknown. It's also worth mentioning that when those trade winds pick up, windblown honeybees could become miniature darts, which DLNR apparently also recognizes. All right, that was a whole lot of negativity. 
But there are a number of reasons for why honeybees are also important in the state. For example, their pollination services can be very important in aiding conservation efforts. In one study conducted at Kaena Point, scientists were interested in determining pollination networks between native coastal plants, native bees, and introduced pollinators, which included bees, wasps, and flies. Now the shading in this figure from their study corresponds to how many visits each plant, with the Hawaiian names listed on the left side, received from each pollinator in the study, which are listed on the bottom, with darker indicating a particular pollinator visited that plant very frequently. In the red box, I highlighted the native Hylaeus bees from the site, and the orange boxes are around the solitary introduced bees. Plants highlighted in green are endemic, meaning they don't occur anywhere else in the world except in Hawaii, with those in blue also being endangered. The remaining plants listed are native, but may occur naturally elsewhere in the world. The native Hylaeus, which in this study were Hylaeus anthracinus and Hylaeus longiceps, were the most important pollinators of the two endangered plants at Kaana Point. Those plants were also pollinated, though not as frequently, by an introduced species of Laceoglossum and Ceratina smaragdula, which are also small bees. This implies that should the native bees go extinct at this location due to resource competition or lost access to nesting sites, the endangered plants could at least continue to be pollinated by the introduced bee species. But what about the honeybees? Interestingly, the fieldwork for this study was conducted in 2008 to 2009, which was right after Varroa destructor mites had been introduced to Oahu causing sharp declines in feral and managed bee colonies. Prior to the study, honeybees were commonly observed at Kaana Point, and they mentioned in their paper that they were also observed in 2014 in the same area. Although the time frame of their research excludes honeybee activity, we can reasonably assume that they would also visit and pollinate native Hawaiian plants, though data related to this has not yet been published. Introduced species have the potential to disrupt plant pollinator interactions by displacing effective pollinators or by replacing extirpated or locally extinct native pollinators. Because native Hawaiian pollinators, including the honey creepers and yellow faced bee, evolved in the absence of social insects like honeybees or wasps, they lack the competitive and defensive mechanisms to withstand impacts from social invasives to their plant pollinator networks. The Western Yellow Jacket, Vespula pennsylvanica, is a damaging introduced species in Hawaii that will prey upon honeybees and yellow-faced bees, as well as aggressively defend carbohydrate resources, such as those found in Ohia lehua plants, from other potential pollinators. In this study, the authors compared the pollination in fruit set in Ohia after two years of yellow jacket eradication efforts at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. They used a paired study design, demonstrated on the right, where they had four field sites where the wasps had been eradicated and four where they had not. These sites were paired based on similarities in rainfall, elevation, and vegetative structure to see what effect wasp eradication had on pollination. At each of the sites, they had three experimental treatments. In the first, fine mesh bags were put over the flowers so no pollinators could reach them. This measured the ability of the plants to self-pollinate. In the second, they covered the flowers which, with large mesh bags so insects could reach the flowers but birds could not. In the third, the flowers were open so all pollinators could reach them. The gray bars are showing the locations where the wasps were removed and the white bars are the paired locations where wasps were still present. They collected data about fruit set pre and post wasp eradication. Though Ohia does have some ability to produce fruit without pollination, around 20%, fruit production was more than three times higher when insect pollinators could reach the flowers, especially after the wasps had been removed from the area. The authors mentioned that they did not see E. E. V., the native pollinator of Ohia, in the study area, and thus concluded that honeybees are efficient enough pollinators of Ohia in the absence of the native pollinator again demonstrating the importance of honeybees in conservation efforts, particularly of this culturally important tree. In addition to pollinating native plants,
honeybees have a rather anthropocentric use as well, namely pollinating agricultural commodities. These two maps are comparing the types of agricultural production that occurred in the state in 1980 through 2015. In this time period, we have lost approximately 200,000 acres of lands from agricultural production, largely driven by the collapse of pineapple and sugarcane plantations. While this has been hard on agricultural communities across the state, it has also created an opportunity to move into more diversified cropping systems and incorporating crops that are bee friendly in the sense that they require insect pollination to some extent, and therefore the pollinators are rewarded with nectar or pollen. Some of these industries that have seen an increase in acreage since 1980 include coffee, macadamia nuts, diversified cropping systems, various tropical fruits, and commercial forestry. The economic impact of pollination cannot be overstated. Hawaiian agriculture across all commodities is valued at around $500 million annually. Pollination services are valued at $212 million, or 42% of all agriculture in Hawaii. This value is based on the market value of crops that require pollination, at least in part. This is surprising because unlike the mainland United States, contracted pollination services are not particularly prevalent in Hawaii, though they may become more important as production of certain commodities increases. Looking at production value data from 2016, Pollinator-oriented commodities account for five of the top 20, coffee, macadamia nuts, landscape plant materials, at least some of which will be valuable to honeybees, cucumbers, which is the most valuable vegetable crop in the state and accounts for over 80% of cucumber consumed in the state, as well as honey. Let's take a closer look at the value of honeybees to the top two pollinator-dependent commodities, starting with coffee. Coffee is valued at around $50 million annually, or about 10% of the state's agricultural income. In a project conducted by a master's student at UH Manoa, Ms. Tavares evaluated the percent fruit set occurring on open pollinated coffee flowers and coffee flowers where insects had been excluded with the mesh bag. In both years of this study, fruit set was increased by 10 to 30% when insects had access to the coffee flowers. Looking at the insects that visited the flowers, Honeybees accounted for 86% of visitation and were the most important at contributing to increased yields. The macadamia nut industry is valued at $42 million annually and, unlike coffee, must be cross-pollinated to set fruit. Using a similar study setup, average fruit set increased dramatically when flowers were open to pollinators. In this case, honeybees accounted for two-thirds of flower visitation with hoverflies accounting for another 25%. Honeybee queen breeding is another industry with a big impact on the state. Our wonderful climate, which can at times make us crepe snow, allows for reliable year-round queen production, which is important for beekeepers who may need to quickly replenish their stocks or replace queens after natural disasters. Queens are sold back to the mainland US and Canada, where 75% of their queens are sourced from Hawaii. Mainland U.S. sources around 25% of their queens from our state. Queen producers will selectively breed for honeybees with a gentle demeanor, which makes them much more pleasant to work with. This industry is valued at $10 million annually and mostly occurs on the Big Island. I mentioned earlier the collapse of the Molokai honey production industry. Fortunately, we have rebounded from this. And while we may not be the nation's largest producer of honey overall, our colonies are first in the nation with regards to the pounds of honey produced per colony. The graph on the right shows how much honey was produced by honeybee colonies nationwide from 1987 through present. The dotted black line on the bottom shows the national average through time. The line on the top shows the Hawaiian average, which is 117 pounds per colony. That's twice the national average. Although we've had ups and downs as a result of bad weather and the introduction of diseases and pests, which have already been present for some time on the mainland, our production is increasing. Not only are we producing more, but the honey we are producing is more valuable and can be marketed as specialty honeys. The majority of honey coming from the mainland is produced from clover and retails for about $7.57 a pound. In contrast, our specialty honeys from Kiabe, Ohia Lehua, and macadamia can retail for up to $40 a pound. For those of you pursuing the advanced certification for the Hawaii Master Gardeners, 
Don't forget to take quiz one found under lesson materials. You will need a score of 70% or greater for credit. Our next lecture will provide an overview of pollination biology.